I guess we'll get started. Uh, my name is John McNabb. I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, this is my third DEF CON and the best one yet. Uh, as you can tell from the slide, I'm speaking about cyber terrorism and the security of the national drinking water infrastructure. A little about me. Uh, by the way, I'm not going to read all the words on every slide. Uh, you can read them faster than I can say them, and I'm going to use them as a jumping off point to you know, mention other things on the same topic as the slide. But I've been an IT pro for five years. It's my second or third career after uh, being in environmental uh, advocacy for clean water action and uh, being a lobbyist for the Massachusetts Environmental Agency. Um, in both capacities, I did a lot of work in water supply protection. And um, my main qualification for talking on, the, on this topic is 13 years until a few months ago as a, a water commissioner in a small town in Massachusetts. Um, I've spoken at uh, uh, one conference so far, and I'm speaking at uh, Freaknik in Nashville uh, later in the year. Um, so I'm trying to make, the purpose of the talk is trying to make a realistic assessment of the potential of a terrorist attack, cyber or kinetic, against the U.S. public water system. Okay, some of you might be wondering, what the hell is a water commissioner? Um, if you're from uh, New England, you might have a glimmer of an idea because most New England towns have a fragmented sort of local government where the executive body is a selectman, the legislature is a town meeting, and then there are various other elected or appointed bodies that do various things. And every town is a little different. In my town's case, and I'm going to try not to mention the name of the town so no one there gets mad at me that I pointed a finger at them. Um, but it's an elected position in my town and in many others in New England, uh, usually three people uh, for a three-year three term each, and it rotates, so one person's up every year. So you can see the picture there of me running for election the first time in 1997. And the pattern usually is for these uh, low-level posts, so, so to speak, as opposed to selectmen or school committee, which are the really high-interest posts in small towns in, in New England, is that you get elected and you're, you're basically not going to be opposed again. And that, was, that happened in my case. I had a relatively easy uh, race against a, one opponent in 97 and then have, have been unopposed ever since. Um, in most other places, and usually in the rest of the country, where you have a mayor and a city council or a town council, um, you know, you, uh, the water department would be under the DPW. But the point is here that I was one of three people for 13 years who were the policy-making body, the managerial uh, staff, and the top of the heap for decision-making. Not day-to-day. -day. I wasn't the IT department. We didn't have an IT department. Um, but I tried to apply my IT knowledge whenever possible when looking at our SCADA system and these questions. Uh, the, biggest, it, the biggest issues that uh, water department's uh, commissioners look at is what's the budget. And it's not that easy to get rate increases. And, and that makes it hard to upgrade equipment uh, a lot of times and to deal with the uh, decaying infrastructure and the new regulations that come into place. So a uh, brief outline, I'm going to go through some definitions. I'm going to talk about threats to drinking water from terrorists or other parties. I'm going to describe uh, the national drinking water infrastructure and some issues relating to that that, that are pertinent to this topic. Now we'll go through the components of a single water system, a notional water system, and I'll discuss the instrumentation in each case, the, the pros and the cons of, of, of an attack vector on that uh, water system. And then I'll tie it all together in talking about SCADA, uh, which there's been a lot of talk at DEF CON this year about, which is good. Um, and then I'll try to wrap it all together with um, a, an assessment of you know, what's really the, the, the extent of the risk, uh, what's been done so far, and what needs to be done. So definitions, public water system, uh, the EPA defines it as a, um, a system that has at least 15 service connections or regularly serves at least 25 individuals. And I'll explain later that's a lot of systems in the U.S. SCADA, it's process control um, instrumentation and software um, used in manufacturing, infrastructure, utilities, et cetera. Um, I realize there are some control systems that aren't technically SCADA, but I'm going to use SCADA as a gen generic term to talk about process control. Um, we call it SCADA, even our little water system, uh, and, it, and it really only runs in the plant and some remote systems, um, but it's, it's the same idea. Critical infrastructure, and that's what this talk is really here for. Why is this talk at DEF CON? Is that um, it's a concern for security of critical infrastructure. And critical infrastructure is is... A quick definition is infrastructure that's essential for the operation of society and the economy. 
There's other more technical definitions. There's a number of different definitions uh, in the um, Bioterrorism Act of 2002. Uh, there are presidential commissions on critical infrastructure going back to 1998, um, and, and a lot of other legislation and regulation that deal with that topic. Um, and there'll be more on that later. And cyber terrorism. Now, there's no accepted definition of terrorism that I've been able to find, and there's no, you get even more complicated if you try to talk about cyber terrorism. And I've heard other speakers use the words, say they use the word cyber only because it's convenient, and I agree with that, because it's got a lot of misconceptions. So without going through the dozen or so definitions that I found in my research, I'm gonna define it as an attack through the cyberspace or the internet or computer that has an effect in the real world, that has a, has a real, you know, that, that breaks something. Whether it's a person or a water supply or shut something down or start something up, um, it's not hacktivism, it's not defacing a web page, what some people call cyber terrorism. We're talking about the stuff that affects the real world from uh, a, an internet connection in most cases. So how important is drinking water? Um, you know in your home, you, you, need it, you need to be able to drink water on a daily basis, you need it to make food, you need it for your, sep for your toilet to flush and, and have sewage, and you need it for fire suppression for the hydrant outside the house. But bigger than that, it supports almost every, critical, every other critical infrastructure that there is. And this is a list I took out of a government report uh, on you know, what, looking at the interdependencies of infrastructures and which ones support, which ones are dependent on drinking water. Agriculture, food, public health, I won't read the whole list. That looks like everything to me, but if there's anything missing, um, it's probably not that important. And on the right-hand side, there were, there, I, I try to look for the, um, the, the, the flow charts that look at the cascading failures from one thing failing. And I couldn't find any that started with drinking water, but they all seem to start with power, of course. So here were two with power, and, and one talks about um, uh, water. And on the top one there, the bottom row, talks about what, you know, po power fails, water fails, agriculture fails. That's not necessarily drinking water, but irrigation water. Um, and, 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 what, and, and it causes a further failure in another sector. And in the bottom one, it's um, power supply disruption, water supply, medical facilities, medical treatment. Um, so you can think about it in almost any, any category. Uh, the water supply fails, something else fails, uh, society um, becomes less effective, uh, there are less services available um, in other sectors of society. So the bottom line is, water we're not talking about water supply for its own sake necessarily, but it's a, it's a, it's a basic requirement for operation of everything. Um, drinking water has been the target of attacks for thousands of years. Uh, and my favorite one is Vlad the Impaler, you know, Dracula. Um, but the real Vlad the Impaler did poison his own wells when he was attacked by the Turks. He did a lot of other nasty things too. Um, but there's a long uh, history uh, in warfare, but also in terrorism and, and uh, of, of water supplies being poisoned. Uh, some, some more recent, but some go back, back uh, centuries. So that the point is that water supplies are, are a natural target um, in war and terrorism. We shouldn't be surprised when someone's threatening to, to attack a water supply or actually attacking it. There have been terrorist threats to poison the U.S. public water supplies, and the, through history, um, uh, there's been some domestic folks, uh, Order of the Rising Sun in Chicago, Typhoid, the Covenant Arm and Sword of the Law Lord in Arkansas, they were threatening to poison water in New York, uh, Chicago, and somewhere else. Um, in both cases, uh, they were caught before they could do anything, and the, ev and the evaluation was they didn't really know what they were doing, and they didn't have enough of, of the substance to really make a, make a, make a, you know, make a difference. But, but it was taken seriously, and there, there were arrests and pr prosecutions there. Uh, there were a number of ones about Al-Qaeda and uh, uh, modern terror groups threatening us. This is a declassified document from a raid at the Tarnak uh, farms in Afghanistan, uh, where uh, if you can read it, it sh it's handwritten of one of the Al Qaeda operatives there, where they were doing had a training session, uh, talking about uh, you know what sort of poisons to use for poisoning water supplies. So there's there's realistic evidence uh, supporting the fact that Al Qaeda um, they've threatened to poison the U.S. water supply, and there's a piece of paper um, you know showing some planning. 
Uh, now, uh, we're talking about cyber, of course, too. In the talk, I'm, ta I'm going to bounce between cyber and kinetic or real-life attacks because either one, they could happen at the same time, actually. Um, so looking through the uh, literature and research and what other people have done in this uh, topic, we've, we've, it boils down to they've got, they, they, they've got people with IT skills. Uh, since, the, since after 9-11, the U.S. Uh, broke up a lot of their um, uh, uh, centers, and they've been using the Internet to coordinate communications. Uh, the evidence seems to suggest that they use the Internet for the same thing almost everyone else does, for communication, organizing, propaganda, information, disinformation for managing the organization. There's evidence that they use it uh, to conduct cyber crime to raise money, um, but not for cyber terrorism as I defined it. Um, I, I corresponded with, with um, Dorothy Denning, a well-known authority on the subject, who's testified before Congress, and uh, she, she testified in 2002-ish that uh, yeah, they, while they do have cyber capabilities for doing these type of things, that they don't seem to be actually using it for terrorism to create uh, to attacks in the, in the kinetic world. And she emailed me a few months ago saying she still has that same conclusion. And I can't find any evidence that they've done that. But again, we don't know everything they're doing. This is the CyberNet Cafe in Britain where a number of Al-Qaeda uh, uh, tra fellow travelers were arrested in Britain a while ago uh, that they used for communications. Uh, there have been some cyber attacks on water systems. Now, this is a short list because there isn't a long list. None of these could be called a cyber terrorism, um, but it's interesting if you go through uh, the details, uh, the Salt River Project was uh, a mod attack via modem. Um, let me find my notes, excuse me. Uh, the Marucci water system is the most popular one where, where a, a consultant who was not hired for a job got very upset and he w used his laptop to communicate wirelessly with the pump uh, centers at the wastewater treatment facilities and he caused at least 46 releases of uh, untreated sewage into the environment. So, so we have a modem, we have wireless. This was uh, Harrisburg, uh, you got a lot of news coverage. I, I, an employee came into the plant uh, with a laptop that it, that it got infected with spyware that then infected the the computers at the water plant so it wasn't anyone actually attacking the water plant but again it was a you know an intrusion the Te tehima Kalusa canal authority um, was an employee who installed some improper software and was alleged to have caused uh damage so that's an employee insider job now RISI, the uh, repository of industrial security incidents uh, which is the authority, I guess, worldwide for keeping track of these things, says that cyber incidents in water systems, and they mean water and wastewater and, and agriculture, it's a broad term, have increased 30 percent. But we'll look at the numbers later. Those still aren't big numbers. Okay. Now, the good news is if, you want to, if some bad guy wants to attack the, the U.S. water infrastructure, it's almost impossible to attack the whole thing because there's 155,000 public water systems, um, they're varied. My water plant is unique. Every water plant is unique. They're not cookie cutters for the most part. They're, they're, they're individually designed and built depending upon the exact characteristics of the water that they use, that they treat, uh, their, their demand, um, the history of the plant, you know, where it started. A lot of plants you know, were built 30, 40 years ago and are sort of organically growing from that. So even if they were all connected, you'd have a devil of a time trying to have the same, you know, cyber attack uh, affect each one. Um, so again, I won't read all of this, but again, the contrast is with the electrical uh, infrastructure down here is that there are three grids in a study, a recent study by a Chinese grad student uh, uh, alleges that uh, uh, one or two attacks on, attack on one or two nodes in any of the grids can cause a cascading failure in the electrical grid and shut the whole thing down. That's, that's what the report said anyway. You can't do that on the water systems. You, you, you shut one plant down and the, the rest of them aren't affected at all. So that's, that's sort of the good news, that they're, um, that they're isolated, except that uh, there are some water conglomerates. The biggest one is American Water, which is the largest private U.S. water provider, which, has, uh, which runs or owns facilities or both in 35 states. Not everything in each of those states, but one or more in each of those states. So it's 15 million people. That's a big chunk of the U.S. population in 1,600 communities. So... Um, I didn't look into their, their networking, 
but if they're networking through all their or most of their systems, that's a potential cyber intrusion that you could get a bigger bang for the buck than going after individual systems. That's a question that I, I, I'll just I'll leave out there. Um, but it's still you know, a question. You, you still can't attack the whole thing at once, cyber-wise or otherwise, but that's a way to um, still create an impact. Again, terrorists don't always have to cause mass casualties. They, they basically, the word terrorist means creating fear. So um, they may only have to say that they've done it and have it occur in a couple places. Um, United Water is the second biggest with seven million and Aquarians in the eastern, U eastern US uh, is in three states. So that's the exception to the fragmentation, but again, um, that makes it likely that the only mass attack could be through cyber if you can do it. Um, but there are water system inter interdependencies um, that bring them together as well. Um, and the biggest one is treatment chemicals. I won't read all the boxes around here, but the biggest one is treatment chemicals. And you can see that um, chlorine gas is used by most systems. And flip side of the fragmentation of the water industry, the water infrastructure, is the concentration of chlorine production. 38% of it's in Louisiana. Um, and, and in, and in a, a short list of other states. So, and, and if we looked at the rail lines, if I did a detailed study of this and looked at the rail lines in Louisiana and some of those plants, you could find some nodes where some, some kinetic attacks could, could slow down the system or do it or DOS it. Uh, we know that Al-Qaeda has considered directly attacking U.S. rail lines. Um, other reasons to attack rail lines, but this, this could be one reason as well. Now, I presented this at the American Water Works Association National Security Conference last year, and it was a much smaller crowd than this for some reason. Um, and I was in a, I was in a group, uh, I was talking on, on a day after the IT talks about the, so, some of the things about SCADA that I'll be talking about later, and I was in a group of folks talking about chlorine. And I don't know if anybody in the, in the audience got it, uh, that, uh, hey, uh, even this isn't the easiest thing to do, it may be impractical, but it's, it's there. And, and somebody needs to be thinking about it. And I haven't found any evidence that anyone in, in, in charge has been, been looking at this problem. Because um, it's not, so, so you've got the concentration of the, of the production facilities, meaning you could DOS the system, you could shut them all down for, you know, if you attack the plants or the rail lines. Uh, that might only work for a short period of time uh, because some plants stockpile, my, my little plant stockpile for a month. Bigger plants, though, get shipments every day, bigger water plants. So that's, that's something that should be thought of. Um, but the strangest thought I had, which uh, I can't get anybody to confirm that, that they're thinking about it, is chlorine's already a, a poison, okay? It's used to kill bacteria and to disinfect the water. My thought was, gee, why couldn't you, could you poison the chlorine? Because when the water comes into the plant, no one tests the chlorine. It's in these cylinders, and you put it in a special room so no one can breathe it and it won't kill people in the building. But you're not, you're, not, you're not sampling it for anything. And actually, there is a substance that I'll withhold that could be used. It's bulky. It's expensive. Um, there, it does exist in the US. It is a chemical that's, that, that is known to be uh, uh, held by Iran and North Korea because it's used to make other weapons of mass destruction. Um, so hopefully it's a far-fetched idea. But I brought it up at the first Water Security Congress right after 9-11, when their panel of experts and their chemists and whatever, and I'm not a chemist, I, I asked them that. I said, tell me, is this crazy? And they went, they didn't say it was crazy. So, I, so I'm worried. But, it, <laughs> but, but, I, but I think what they say in Mythbusters is it's, it, it may be plausible but impractical. But again, somebody should be thinking about, you know, looking into that. Uh, so types of attacks in general, if you're going after individual systems, are uh, broken down into chemical, biological, physical disruption, and disruptions of SCADA. Uh, honestly, the, the good old-fashioned sabotage might work best, but again, if, you, if you're attacking water systems in the U.S., how many are you going to attack? You know, you, you, that needs a large manpower base to do kinetic attacks and do bombings and stuff. And Al-Qaeda didn't say they were going to shut down the water, they said they're going to poison it. And that's much harder to do. But these are the options. Um, but if you can have chemical, biological, or radiological contamination, it's got to meet four criteria. Uh, it's got to be weaponized. So the, 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 it's got to be soluble in the water or not soluble in the water, depending on what it is. Um, it's it's got to be infectious or toxic from drinking water. It's got to be stable, meaning it doesn't 
um, isn't consumed by, by being transported in the water, and it's going to be chlorine resistant. Now, I'll go through the components of the water system later. Obviously, it's going to be chlorine resistant if it goes in before, if it goes like in the reservoir and goes into the plant. But it's still going to be chlorine resistant if it goes in later because there's always going to be chlorine in the water. To, there's going to be some chlorine residual in the water when it gets to your house or at the end of the system to make sure that you don't have bacterial growth in the pipes. So there's a short list of CBR that are, that are plausible. And again, I'm not going to go into those details as much as uh, other experts on that subject might. Uh, but it also could be a combination attack. So, for example, uh, uh, some of you may have heard in the news uh, that in May there was a boil water order in the, in the Boston area. And uh, what, what happened was that they, there was a single point of failure in the 26-inch, in the it was a gigantic water pipe from the Quabbin Reservoir into the Boston system, uh, and it just broke. And water was spewing hundred, you know, hundreds of feet in the air uh, until they were able to stop it. And that was the water uh, that was um, treated water uh, going into the, uh, it's a whole, Mass Water Resources Authority is a, is, a, is a wholesaler, and they distribute it to 68 towns in the Boston area. Um, so they couldn't get treated water to people, but they still had to get water out to the system to keep the, to, for fire suppression and also to, to run sewer systems. So they still ran the water, and then they did public campaigns that tell people, boil the water, don't drink the water, do this, do this, here's where we'll get boil, bottled water, and so on. So what if uh, an adversary did the same thing and blew up a pipe and then disrupted the communications? Then people wouldn't know, or not as many people would know, that they, they had to boil the water. So again, there's a lot of scenarios like that where you don't necessarily have to poison the water uh, to cause a problem. If it's not chlorinated and it's not treated, it, it's going to cause problems. Okay, so here are the public water system components. And I, I used, a, there's a lot of different um, diagrams I could get, and this one attempts to show some of the, some of the instrumentation and the SCADA components. Um, in security, we've got CIA, confidentiality, confidentiality integrity, availability. Um, they've got PSA. You have to have sufficient pressure of the water. It's got to be safe to drink, and it's got to be available. Now, the pressure, I won't talk about much more, but the pressure comes from the pumps at the treatment plant that push the water out at a certain pressure. And it's got to be the same as at the top of the water, of the water column in the water tanks. Um, so pressure can come from either way. Um, and, of course, you lose pressure if you have a break in a pipe, which happens, it's a routine thing. Safe to drink, of course, is the quality of the water in the reservoir or the well, um, and then after it is treated, but also uh, how, it, how it is affected by the pipes. Um, the, the condition of the pipes uh, isn't something you usually think of for, for safe to drink, but it is. And I'll, it's not a big topic for this talk, but it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a gigantic topic for uh, making sure that the water coming out of the tap is, is safe to drink and actually good to drink, and you want to drink it, and it's not cloudy, and, and uh, it's clear. And available on demand, of course, is, is, is the key thing. It doesn't do any good to do the rest if you can't get it to the people's taps. So source of water supply. Uh, after 9-11, uh, people were scrambling uh, before, you know, at water plants anyway, water systems, before we got any direction. Um, and I remember the MWRA, the Mass Water Resources Authority, Water, Resor water Resources Authority, uh, the biggest one in Massachusetts, uh, spent millions of dollars with the armed guards and building, building fences and so on around the Quabbin Reservoir and around uh, reservoirs. Um, and we had the similar thoughts in my town, uh, and that's my reservoir there. Um, actually, that's the pond. There's another reservoir uh, that we share with the state. And we were concerned with, um, you know, immediate, what do we do now? And so we, we tried to, I tried to block vehicular access as much as we could to the reservoir, but you can't in many cases because they're big. Um, then as, as we got more details and, and things filtered down from the EPA and the State Environmental Agency, uh, it became clear that it, it's not impossible to poison a large water supply, but it's, again, very impractical. Um, and the example I got uh, in my research is the Dillon Reservoir. Someone did a calculation uh, what it would take to contaminate it, and um, it's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of contaminant. So someone would have to dump, you know, you'd have to have tanker trucks backing into the place. Again, not impossible, but again, if you're, if you're an adversary, is that, is that you're going to want to do that in 10 or 100 places? Unlikely, but so, so it's good to be vigilant about it, but again, it's, we're not really worried 
that this will be the first place someone would attack. Now, on the other hand, uh, I've done a lot of work in protecting water supplies for clean water action in the state and in my town, and there's a lot of examples of uh, well, well fields getting out of commission because they're contaminated from leaking underground storage tanks, petroleum, et cetera, also nitrates if uh, septic systems are too close together. Uh, Superfund sites, there's a water supply. I worked with a citizens group in Wilmington, Mass., um, that uh, to deal with a Superfund site that knocked out half the town's water supply in we that were wells. So it's, it's not unusual at all for a well field to be knocked out of commission. That's usually if it's what's called a confined aquifer, so it's an underground pond, basically, with clay on the boundaries, say, or rock, or something relatively impermeable. So something spills in it, it stays in it, and the concentrations go up, and you can't drink it anymore. Uh, that's not that uncommon. So, so well fields are most vulnerable. Again, but it's the same problem with dilution. So, you know, you've got a Superfund site in Wilmington, for example, for decades was dumping God knows what, TCE, PCE, uh, all sorts of, you know, industrial chemicals into the ground. And over decades, it, 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 it killed the water supply. So again, that's difficult for an adversary to do on purpose. Now, instrumentation, it, there's a wide variety of, um, of instrumentation, well, maybe not that wide, but um, depending upon the source, in a, in a, in a surface water supply, a, a pond, lake, or reservoir, uh, you often have stream flow controls where you try to keep track of the stream flow um, going in and out of the pond uh, to control the uh, water balance. Uh, you, you, you might, you, in some cases, you have a real-time control uh, monitoring of water quality, although that's, that's fairly rare. And in many cases, those would feed into the SCADA system. So you'd have a, a route potentially for data or an attack from these uh, instrumentation systems into the SCADA system. But the biggest sort of impact would be, say, a dam, obviously. If you had a dam that was radio controlled or SCADA controlled or um, some other remote control uh, for it, um, you can think that if you, could, if you could open the floodgates in a dam, uh, or close it so it would spill over, or uh, combine that with a, a kin kinetic attack, um, that's, a, that's an area for, for causing serious damage. Okay, the water treatment plant, that's where the heart of the SCADA system is, um, and I won't go through the entire treatment process, um, but it's, um, you know, you have, to, you have to intake the water, you coagulate it to take out the bigger pieces of solid matter. Flocculation further takes out the solid matter. Uh, chemical addition, you have to control the pH and some other, some other parameters. Uh, filtration um, takes out um, you know, everything else. And chlorination is used uh, for the most part for disinfection, but also in New England anyway, uh, to oxidize iron and manganese, uh, which is a common contaminant in New England. Um, and then it goes to the clear well, something called the clear well, which it could be inside the plant, could be under the plant, could be a tank outside the plant. And that's probably the most vulnerable part of the plant because it's after all the processes. Um, and this is where the heart of the SCADA system is. And again, I'm used to a, a small system with one plant. Um, you can be a moderate size system and have four or five treatment plants and maybe have one SCADA system that, you know, works for all of them. Um, now, usually they're in a building, and the building is alarmed. Uh, it's got fences, uh, et cetera. But here's a picture of a plant in uh, Florida uh, that I took a few years ago. That's, um, out, those, are all the, those are the tanks. That's the processing facility. Um, you know, it's not, not really that well protected. However, it's on an island that that's, that's, has a gate, and it's very hard to get to. But again, it's, they don't have much weather there, I guess, so it's, it's uh, relatively exposed. Um, so again, what could you do with a plant if you were attacking it? Uh, a kinetic attack, I think, would boil down to this uh, plain old sabotage. You'd blow something up and stop, stop uh, the production. And that's the most dangerous thing, actually, because uh, every plant is individually built and designed, and the pumps, the high-level pumps that create the pressure, uh, don't, you don't get them off the shelf. Uh, in my plant, it took 18 months to get a replacement, and we didn't want to go out when we didn't you know, we didn't plan on it, and we had to run in one pump for like 18 months. Then, then we made, the water commissioners made a rule that let's buy another one and keep it on stock. So that's probably the most likely one if they're going after one, one plant. Um, if, you were, if you were going to, uh, uh, if you had the capability to do a, SCADA, a, a cyber attack on it, and I'll be getting to that a little more later, uh, you could perhaps uh, change the dosing 
of the chemicals. And it's been alleged that uh, the, the, the most likely thing to do would be increase the chlorine, because too much chlorine in the water can be harmful to health. Uh, you could also reduce the chlorine and then, then shut off the sensors that monitor it going out. And that would cause bacterial growth in the, in the water, which doesn't sound that uh, dangerous, but that would cause diarrhea and other gastrointestinal problems, which can be fatal. So that's poisoning of a type. Um, Finished water storage, uh, again, water tanks. Um, this is an old tank that we had in my town before we repainted it. Uh, the high school, it was behind the high school, and they, the high school kids wrote a derogatory term about the principal up there in 1965. So they, um, that's the racing stripe, which we called it for decades. Now, uh, a lot of water, water systems have single points of failure, um, is what a lot of the studies say. And it, from 1965, when this was built, to uh, 2000, that was the only water tank in the town. And, and it was such a single point, such a problem that we couldn't clean it because when you take down the water tank, you have no, you have no place to store water and it affects the pressure and everything in, in the town. So it wasn't until we built the second tank that we were able to actually clean out the tank, which is a indication of the noise that we have in water, water supply. Uh, terrorists would have to do quite a bit to uh, get over the noise where you know pipes break, uh, water uh, gets dirty, uh, water tanks um, you know get get contaminated with um, bacteria. Um, th there's a lot going on that, that we don't need terrorists to have problems with water tanks, for example. Uh, Woburn, Mass, which has a history of again wells being contaminated. If you in the, in the movie Civil Action, you all probably heard about. Uh, two years ago, they had a, they'd have boil water order because uh, the the, the one of their tanks got polluted with bird shit uh, because they had, they had allowed the top of the tank to be corroded and the birds would perch on it and, and defecate into the water. And they didn't, de they didn't find that out until it was too late and they had to boil water water. Then they had to take that tank out, they had more than one tank fortunately, and then drain it, clean it, fix the top, put it back in service. So there's a lot going on in water systems without terrorists, you know, um, getting in the way. Yes. <laughs> no, no. They were never identified either. Um, uh, and so the level of the water in the tank is very important. And here's, here's, our, here's our readout from our SCADA uh, screen uh, for the water tank level, um, for example. Uh, now, the water distribution system. Now, to boil the whole talk all down, this is the most vulnerable part of the system. Um, in all the studies and, and, and research since 9-11 and before when people looking at this question, the bottom line is the most vulnerable part are the pipes and the fire hydrants. Um, because it's after treatment, in most cases there's no monitoring of the pipes or the water in the, the pipes. Uh, there, there are f federal regulations for monitoring certain areas of the pipes for bacteria, chlorine residual, and then four times a year uh, for trilomethanes and hyaluronic acids, which are formed by the um, uh, interaction of, of chlorine and solid matter in, in the water. Um, but the most likely attack that would cause human casualties uh, from all, all the studies that I've seen and from the experts is, is putting water in through a hydrant. And it's usually a targeted attack because if you, with an, there were studies showing that if you did it within a half mile of, say, a, a targeted building, that um, it would, you'd get a high concentration in nine minutes. Uh, I don't know all the details of that, but um, it, it's, it's a possibility. Um, you could put water in a hydrant with the intention of, of contaminating all the water in the uh, distribution system, and it might work, except that, um, again, the, the noise, the things that always go wrong, uh, it's been a constant problem in my system where uh, valves, uh, in intersections uh, you have valves and you should have valves in all the hydrants. And in most cases the valves are decades old, they haven't been exercised, no one knows if they work, and in most, case, most cases they might be broken uh, closed. Um, so it's very hard even for the water operators to know what are the hydraulics of the system. So an attacker from outside is not really going to want to know, know that. So if you're reliably trying to poison a community by putting water even in the distribution system, it's a good chance it'll work, 
but again, you've got, you've got uh, uh, dilution to worry about, and you don't really know where the water's going to go. Um, so the, the most likely scenario is that, it's, that, that there could be a targeted attack by either pumping water from one building into the system, and at least with some assurance that it's going in a certain direction to another building that's your target, or in a, in a hydrant. Now, there's 1.8 million miles of water pipes in the U.S. That's an estimate. No one really knows for sure. Uh, there are between 6 and 12 million fire hydrants. No one seems to know. I checked with the National Association of Fire Hydrants, or whatever it was called, and uh, <laughs> Fire Protection Association, et cetera, emails and checking their websites. And, and I, I dug down with one analyst, and he said, well, no one knows. No one's, no one's counting it. The point is there's a lot of fire hydrants. Um, and even in one community, uh, the, 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 the rule is supposed to have, you're supposed to have one every 1,000 feet, which could be, that, that isn't usually always followed. But in, even, but in a city, there's going to be hundreds. In a small town, there's going to be dozens. So there's, there's a large potential for um, those to be used as vectors for contamination. Now, some communities have put in locks on the hydrants, which, of course, is a practical issue with, you know, fighting a fire. Uh, so it's one more thing for the firemen to do when they're racing up to put the fire out. So I personally would, would balance that against the, the very remote chance of, of the fire hydrant being used as a vector and, and not do that. Uh, the other option is that there are, there are backflow preventers, I'm not sure the term, um, a check valve uh, that you can put in it that prevents you from in, putting anything into the, pi, into the hydrant. Um, but again, that's a major cost and uh, the national cost for even six million hydrants could be, could be quite high. So there, are, there is a countermeasure um, but the best countermeasure is one that's been recommended by a number of studies, which is unlikely to be done nationwide because of the cost, and until something really bad happens, um, is, is having constant water monitoring. You, there, there are, there are, there's technology now uh, for 24-7 monitoring of the quality of the water in the system. Of course, you only test for what you're looking for. So, if they, so, so you'd have to have a short list of things that you'd be expecting would be the likely contaminant and they could get you with something that isn't. But there, you could look at classes of chemicals, you could look at uh, 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 markers. So it's better than what we have now where you, we have no, we are have no, really have no idea. Now I was talking about the noise uh, in the system and, and honestly, if you're, if you're running a water department, terrorism is not the first thing you're worrying about. And the only time you do anything is when they, someone tells you to do it. Uh, again, in, uh, you got water main breaks, not all the time, but fairly often. Um, discolored water because of the buildup of sediment in the pipes uh, or a treatment plant breakdown or the tank hasn't been cleaned in a while. You got to deal with un uh, unpaid water bills. Aging infrastructure, it's a national uh, issue. Uh, the, um, the, the water infrastructure gets a D minus uh, from, the, from a national association for the poor condition of the, of, the, of the water pipes, the water treatment plants, the entire water infrastructure in the country. It's, it's uh, in some cases 100 years old in, in my part of the country, the east, and, and a lot of things are still original equipment. Uh, maintenance, new regulations uh, create costs and, and require uh, work. Vandalism is probably more of a issue than, than terrorism, of course and getting more money to do all these things. So it, it's, you know, the, we only did something in my town when, when uh, after 9-11, I mean, we, we talked about it, but we waited till we, we were told what, what, what are the three things, you know, the 10 things you're supposed to do, and I'll get to that. Um, but it's, it's, it's tough justifying spending money for things like this, uh, unless you have a, a, an actual event or threat or direction from a government entity. Now let's talk about SCADA. Um, we, we changed uh, from, uh, to SCADA a few years ago from the old control center here, electromechanical controls, Allen Bradley, PLCs. Um, the, you, you saw in the earlier slide the, uh, the, the, the SCADA screen for the level of water in the tank. On this one, it's, it's a pen, pen recorder here that we have to check every day. Now, this is semi-automatic. But what happens is, is when the operator comes in in the morning, and in our plant, we didn't run 24-7. We didn't really need to. Uh, most places do. Um, so we only had it manned when we were operating it, which is maybe 8 to 12 hours a day. So they'd come in, and they'd set the speed of the water coming in. And that would set, then they'd, 
they have a formula and they set the chlorine, the chlorine uh, injection and the, uh, what the concentration of the other chemicals should be. So it was a lot of hands-on stuff, which meant they were paying attention. And it's a small plant so they could walk around and check everything. Um, now we went to a, a SCADA system where we've got a very nice self-explanatory HMI human, human machine interface. Um, that's that's like push so instead of pushing the buttons up here you, you see it all here But then you you know you only have to set it once and then it everything else happens automatically um, And it's an Ethernet connection throughout the plant, but it builds upon the old relays and and uh, and PLCs in the system um, through an old relay box So it, it the water commissioners liked it because we got more control over the quality of the water uh, we, we were able to have better assurance that uh, it was being operated properly and we got reports on what happened. Uh, the bad news is that no one was thinking about, um, well, what exposure that does this give us? And we have remote facilities. We have a, we have a well field. We have the two tanks. Uh, we, have the dam, we have a dam. And those are all connected electronically, either radio or uh, cellular or cable. We get all, we get all of the above. Or Ethernet. Um, to the plant, so that's that's a big big problem. So studies show um, the uh, McAfee uh, did a study called In the Crossfire that came out recently that they surveyed a number of SCADA uh, people with SCADA, not just water, uh, throughout the country, and 76% said they were connected to an IP network of the internet. So there's an exposure there, um, and 47 of them, 47% realized that that created a security issue. Surprise. Um, Team Simru, um, a, a security research firm, uh, produced this heat map. They, they, in their Darknet project, they, uh, they, they scanned for, well, receiving uh, scans for, for SCADA ports. And they found a lot of activity. And that's, that's a good question. Who's scanning our SCADA ports and why? We don't know. Uh, there are test bed studies. Uh, uh, by various researchers that show that external contactors can penetrate systems, like most of us here would know. And, and I mentioned the power grid issue. Okay. So uh, RISI, which I mentioned earlier, uh, the um, Repository of Industrial Security Incidents, um, is showing a general trend of increase in incidents, which again are not all um, intentional. But it's, it's instructive that, that they're increasing. And that's where we got the 367% increase for water. Again, the numbers are pretty small. 22% uh, were targeted attacks. The rest are mostly malware. Um, there's been s debatable stories, but some co confirmation that there's been, there's been cyber attacks that shut down water, power systems outside the US. Um, and also reports that the US electric grid has been uh, re repeatedly penetrated. Uh, now, you probably heard about Stuxnet. Uh, the, the, it just came out July 12th, I believe, and there's been a lot of news on it. I did some research. Uh, this seems to be the first malware that targeted a SCADA system. Since most SCADA systems are on Windows, uh, XP, for the most part, is advertised by this vendor as being uh, a robust platform for uh, running the SCADA system, uh, and that's what we use in my plant. Um, but it was particularly targeted for Siemens, Symantec, WinCC, and PS, P, PCS7 SCADA software, which is used in a wide variety of form uh, in, uh, of applications, but also water. The American Water Works Association put out a, war a, a bulletin a few days ago uh, uh, alerting their members to this um, and telling them whatever they knew at the time about what to do. Uh, Microsoft has a patch, which doesn't seem to be doing too much, uh, but... Um, uh, there's a Siemens has has SysClean, and I believe, believe Trend Micro has one as well. Um, and, and the first guesses were that it was industrial espionage, but then some analysts are saying it could also be used to control the systems, give the, give the malware uh, attacker the um, the same administrative rights as the as the you know the user of the system. So looks like the toothpaste is out of the tube. I mean, there could be copycats for the other SCADA manufacturers. Um, it could be this is a, this could be a it, the beginning of a bad trend of SCADA specific software. Now there are studies on the potential impacts of a cyber attack in a public water system SCADA. Um, I won't read through the whole list, but um, 
It's not out of the question if you can get into the SCADA system through the Windows platform or Linux or anything else that you can, you can interfere with the operations and cause changes. It's not that easy. As you'll notice in all my examples earlier, I couldn't come up with an actual uh, terrorist or other attack that, that actually did that. But the Siemens uh, uh, Stuxnet um, malware shows that uh, the, the bad guys are going that direction. Um, so trying to wrap up here, what's the extent of the cyber kinetic risk to public water systems? On the one hand, it's too big and exposed to protect. Um, but, the, but on the other hand, the fragmentation makes it hard to attack. Um, there are some single points of failure I mentioned. Um, I mentioned the crumbling infrastructure. There's, there's estimated to be a 350 billion national shortfall in funds needed for that. So before you even get to, to attacks by terrorists or other folks, the, 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 the infrastructure is already in bad shape. Uh, there's frequent unintentional contamination, uh, water main breaks, other things. Uh, so again, a, a terrorist is going to have to do quite a bit to get through the noise of the, 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 the problems that occur anyway. Uh, what's being done to protect public drinking water systems? And I listed the government things that have been happening so far. Um, there's some research, SCADA hunting net, test beds, SANS has been working on um, methods to use to uh, harden and um, strengthen the security. Uh, the Bioterrorism Act, Bioterrorism Act of 2002 is the one that has had the largest impact from where I was sitting. That required us to do vulnerability assessments um, and, and send that to the, D, to the EPA and then to do a emergency response plan. And those had to be done by 2004-2005. Uh, and that's it. Um, so on my water system, we, we we got the vulnerability report. We hired a, a consultant who, who was in the business of doing that, gave us a lot of very good recommendations, and we followed some of them. And because no one tells us to do, you know, here's, here's the 10 things you have to do. So, so I'm not aware of any study that says, here's the status of every water system in the United States on doing minimum required or recommended security for kinetic or cyber. And that's part of the big problem. It's local control of water systems, and uh, it's a wide variety of, 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 of security. What still needs to be done? Um, estimate of 1 to 1.6 billion uh, to implement the security recommendations of the government, but also other, other bodies. Uh, the bottom line is, since the, the most vulnerable part of the system is the distribution system, is real-time monitoring of water in the distribution system. Uh, don't hold your breath. Uh, uh, I don't have a cost estimate for that, but uh, it's, it's, pr it's probably not going to happen until it's too late or there's a major attack somewhere. But that's your, your, your really only security uh, from all the other possible attack vectors is checking the quality of the water as it gets to the customers. Uh, and my opinion is there should be some EPA required standards. And all the post 9-11 um, changes in governance of DHS and so on, the EPA is still left in charge of everything to do with water supplies. Um, so they've got a, they, they give strict regulations for water quality, uh, training of operators, blah, 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 for running the plant. I think my personal recommendation is they should, you know, take, say, the 21 steps to improve cybersecurity of SCADA networks, apply it to water systems, and, and, and require it to be universally adopted. They have the authority to do it. Um, and as we've seen, there's a, there's a possibility of, of exposure if they don't. And so... Conclusion, this mostly wraps up everything I've been saying so far. Uh, water systems are attractive targets. There are historically been targets for, uh, in warfare and, and by terrorists. There have been cyber attacks on water systems. There's been cyber incidents and attacks on SCADA systems in general. So we have to assume there's a vulnerability there. Um, I wrote this before the Stuxnet uh, malware came out. So the toothpaste may be out of the tube. There may be other ones going on we haven't heard about yet. Um, it's possible for a kinetic or cyber attack to uh, degrade water quality or, or shut down or poison, shut down the system or poison the water. So this needs to be taken more seriously uh, by the government. Um, and it's got to be the government that comes down uh, to, on the private and public water systems and makes, you know, universal requirements. Until that happens, um, a cyber terrorist or, a, you know, regular terrorist uh, means uh, can wreak havoc on the water systems. Uh, thank you.